Hello, and welcome to another episode of Screen Bites, our thought leader series where we learn from industry experts about the latest trends and challenges from across the conversion TV space. I'm your host, Michael Beach. This week, I'm joined by Mark Zagorski. Mark is the CEO of Double Verify and one of the best in the business. In our talk, we cover the future of measuring video ad effectiveness and where the overall market is headed. Please enjoy my conversation with Mark Zagorski. Well, Mark, welcome to Screen Bites. Hey, thanks. Great to be here. Excellent. Uh, we'll start you off with an icebreaker. Uh, we'd like to ask all of our guests, um, you know, what was your first job and what lessons have applied to your career? Oh, great, great question. Uh, my first real job where I had an official paycheck where they took taxes out and stuff like that was I was a bus boy at a, a truck stop, an LB's Big Boy uh, in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was a bus boy there. I was the opening bus boy. So it means I, on weekends I had to come in at around 5.30 a.m., and shovel the, the pathway and then deal with all the, the early morning truckers who were coming in to get their breakfast. So it was, uh, it was an interesting first job for a kid, um, but uh, it, it, it taught me a few things. Uh, the first is uh, I never want to have a job like that again. So anything I could do to get the hell out of there would be, would be important. Um, but but uh, seriously though, it, did, it, it, it taught me about how really cogs in a machine work. And when you're a bus boy, if you know like, um, th there are multiple critical links in running a restaurant. And if any one of them fails, the whole system falls apart. And I think that whether you're in a restaurant or a digital ad business, um, it's still the same. If any critical link fails, whether it's engineering or client service or product, you know, the whole machine falls apart. So there's no more important cog than another in a machine. Every cog that connects to each other keeps that thing rolling. So that was probably my first sense of, you're not the only person in the world. Everything needs to work together well um, for the whole system to work together well. I love that. And as a child of Ohio, I've spent my fair amount of time in a, in a big boy, so I can appreciate that. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, how, you know, how'd you get started in the media space? And I guess more importantly, how'd you end up leading a publicly traded company? Yeah, so I, I actually didn't uh, initially go into media after school. I was in, in the uh, in the fashion marketing business. So I worked for J. Crew Group. Um, right out of grad school and was a marketing analyst, um, but really got the internet bug early um, and, and worked at an agency, um, one of the first digital ad agencies, um, which was uh, Modem Media, Poppy Tyson, which uh, Modem was the source of the first online banner ad ever created. Um, so all of this disaster was, was, came out of the agency where I started. Um, and, uh, you know, that was 20 years ago. And it's funny, you know, modem went public back in, you know, wave 1.0 back in, uh, I think it was 1999, uh, they went public. So it was my first experience uh, in a public company. It was also one of the first experiences I had in digital media. And, uh, you know, 25 plus years later, I guess, I am still in digital media, uh, still uh, still at a, at a public company, but this time instead of being, you know, a junior employee who got some options that ended up being worthless, I'm a, I'm a CEO. Oh, that's great. And, you know, kind of, would you mind giving our audience a sense of, of kind of where Double Verify fits in the, in the ad ecosystem? Yeah. So, so think of DV as a, you know, or software platform that is really focused on driving outcomes for advertisers um, by looking at two things, ensuring that their ad spend is, um, is delivered efficiently so that it's, um, not wasted on fraud or ads that can't be seen by human beings or aren't seen by humans that are, you know, that are bots um, and, and ensure that those um, ads, when they are delivered, are delivered in an environment, a digital environment that aligns with who they are as, as a brand, right? So it's brand safe. So think of really um, ad delivery optimization and brand safety. So a platform, we're basically a platform that does that for major brands all around the world. And we do it across both the open internet so think of, you know, regular websites, wherever someone may advertise, as well as the, the closed or walled gardens. So the social networks, CTV platforms, et cetera. Um, and we do that for programmatic buys, for people who are buying uh, programmatically, as well as people who are buying direct. So they ping us. We're an analytics platform. They ping us before that ad even gets rendered or delivered um, to ensure that it is being delivered to a real person and a real environment and done so in a brand safe way. Well, you know, who's your primary customer and is it kind of what's the balance overall between buyer and seller? Yeah. So we work with 
both buyers and sellers, um, you know, in the digital space, uh, a majority of our customers are our major advertisers and agencies. So the brands that are doing the spending. Uh, however, we do work with platforms um, and with publishers. So folks that are are also looking to um, better clean up their inventory. So if they're a platform to make sure that the inventory they've coming in from publishers and from other third party sources is fraud free, you know, meet certain viewability criteria. And from a publisher perspective, we help them do the same is make sure that their inventory is packaged up the right way. Um, but for the most part, you know, over 90% of our revenue comes from buyers who are interested in ensuring that their buys are, are brand safe, viewable and, and, um, and, and delivered uh, to a, a true audience. You know, kind of our worldview and, and kind of really the reason for our company is you know, we, we believe the future is cross screen. And so most of the, our customer base are either coming from the linear side and trying to, to become more digital or, you know, start off on the digital side and are trying to, to combine linear. Do you find that, you know, most of your customer base you know, are digital CTV and are, are, are trying to combine it with linear or, or, or coming from the linear side first? Yeah, I mean, you know, so we're, we're a digital first company, right? So we started off in, you know, analyzing, you know, banner transactions and then moved to mobile and then it was video and mobile video. And now that video has evolved into connected television. So, you know, when, when our advertiser partners look at us, um, they're really looking at a company that has evolved over time in the digital space and now has moved as television has become really a digital media, right, um, that they're looking at TV in the same way that they've looked at all of their other digital media, which, which is, is it viewable? Um, you know, is it being delivered uh, to a real human being? And am I delivering an ad in an environment that's fraud free as well? So most of the, the folks that we're dealing with are not traditional linear TV buyers. They're coming out of the digital s spectrum. However, um, as what I'm sure many of the people that you've talked to have seen is that there's this mashing together of linear departments and digital departments because of the fact that, you know, TV is TV. And whether I'm watching it, you know, through a, a an IP connection on a, a laptop or a mobile phone, um, or I'm watching it, you know, on a screen with a cable box plugged into it, p consumers don't make a distinction anymore. So advertisers need to be thinking that same way, which is this is a sight, sound, and motion experience for a consumer. And they don't care how they get it. So if we as an advertiser need to be thinking across all of these things in a very seamless way. Yeah, and the one thing, you know, uh, no matter what perspective they're coming from, they both want to buy CTV, and we're kind of finding that uh, demand is outpacing supply. I guess a two-part question. First, you know, are you seeing the same thing? And second, uh, my assumption would be that that kind of environment is ripe for fraud without a platform like yours. You know, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. So in my previous life, I ran a company called Talaria, which was very focused on CTV. So we were a sell side platform in CTV, and we worked with folks like Hulu and Pluto and um, Fubo TV and Tubi and all those folks. So I'm real familiar with kind of the evolution of where CTV has come, particularly ad supported CTV. Um, and what you've noted is right on, which is there's way more supply, or way more demand than there is supply right now. Um, and it you know, reminds me of the early days of social, which is kind of like, oh my God, I don't care. I just, everyone's going there. I just need to advertise there. I don't care what it is. So it really is a seller's market in many ways. Um, because of that, it's created a couple challenges. The first is a lack of transparency for buyers, um, particularly if they're looking to buy programmatically, um, because sellers just don't need to provide as much information as they have had in the past, which is like, hey, I can just sell you Pluto or I can just sell you Hulu and I don't need to give you any specifics, particularly if you're buying it programmatically because um, you'll buy it anyway. So like, there's, there's, there's a little bit of lack of transparency there. What that also leads to is what you noted before as well, which is there's definitely um, an attraction then because of the lack of transparency for fraud to seep into it. And it's the combination of huge amounts of demand, limited supply, lack of transparency, and the fact that the CPMs in connected television are so much higher than they are in any other digital media. And it's kind of like, you know, the, if you're going to rob a bank, 
Do you want to rob a bank that only deals with dollars and coins? Or do you want one that has only $100 bills running through it, right? If the CPM of a mobile ad is five bucks and the CPM of a CTV ad is 40 bucks and it takes the same amount of work to bust down that door to steal it, I'm going after $40 for every impression, right? So, you know, the combination of a market environment, which is ripe for kind of bad behavior, plus the fact that if I get away with this bad behavior, it's worth a lot more to me than, you know, than in other spaces, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a challenging situation. And, and, you know, in the last year we saw, you know, over 1800 fraudulent apps, 1800 fraudulent CTV applications that, that existed. These were apps that were, had either illegitimate content, um, ran multiple ads in the background as users downloaded them. You no. Know, and, and this is the interesting part is, this type of scheme plus that of what we call spoofed URLs. So these are URLs that may be, may be showing video, but it's video that's actually ending up on someone's mobile phone. They make it look like it's coming from a CTV device. We see 500,000 fraudulent device sig signatures a day, a day. So like, you know, think of that, the scale of what we're looking at here. And this is, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So this is a big deal. and and. The, the, the interesting thing about this, and I know I'm kind of belaboring this fraud discussion, but the interesting thing about this is all of these methods that people are using for fraud and CTV are the same things we saw on mobile and the same things we saw on display. It's like people rob the banks the same way that they did 100 years ago. They walk in with a gun and they ask for money, right? There's, there's no, been no interesting new ways of people to rob banks anymore. They may come in with a different mask or a different note, but it's the same way. And we're seeing the same thing in CTV. It's like... People used to spoof URLs to look like mobile because mobile CPMs are higher. Now they're spoofing URLs for CTV because CTV are higher. And they're creating false apps just like they did in mobile. They created fake apps. So it's a lot of the same stuff over and over again. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is that as buyers become more sophisticated, as our platform becomes more sophisticated, we're able to root out a lot of these issues. And I think, you know, not that they'll ever go away because fraud is always a challenge, but, we, you know, we're getting better at chasing these things down. Yeah, they're dusting off their uh, 2013 year of mobile playbook. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, we're recording this the first week of May, and uh, the IB is holding their annual new fronts. Um, I'm interested, especially with your perspective from the coming from Telaria. You know, how's the marketplace changed over recent years? Yeah, I mean, look, I think particularly when it comes to CTV and cross cross platform kind of video, there's there's been a maturing. And it, it's, it's gone from a, wow, this is experimental, a neat thing for us to try out, to uh, this is a must-have in our portfolio of buying. Like, we, we, we just can't ignore it anymore. It's not like, oh, let's try some CTV or let's try some mobile video. It's, no, we know that our market is so uh, fragmented and people are looking at and engaging with video on so many different screens that we have to be in all these places or we'll not get the reach that, that we wanted, right? We know that um, you know, household penetration of traditional cable connections continues to decline every year to the point where um, if it's either this year or next year, um, a, a majority of households will not have a traditional cable connection in it. So to reach a majority of U.S. households, you're going to have to layer on CTV and digital. And I think the upfronts now are much more cognizant of that and saying, you know, we're not at, we're, you know, the new fronts, you know, we're not just an adjunct to your big upfront buy. We're like an equal complement to what you need to do. And I think when you look at the attitudes of the sellers, they're more professional. When you look at the investment that the parent companies are making into these, some of these upfront or the new front presentations, like these are the real deal, right? It's just like the, you know, it's like the old upfronts. They're bringing stars out on, on screen, you know, um, you know, it's a, it's a big show. And I think the new fronts are really, you're going to see new fronts and upfronts kind of <laughs> jam together. And, and you know, look, even companies like, like Double Verify now are engaged in new fronts, you know, as we launch new products um, that cover connected television. Um, we just did a presentation with one of our big partners, wreck -It, at the upfronts to launch um, our authentic attention solution for, for CTV and video, which is all about measuring engagement across multiple screens and seeing it, uh, consumer attention. So um, it's really become, I would say it's funny, they are new fronts,
but at the end of the day, it's really becoming, you know, much more of a traditional upfront kind of approach. Yeah, and earlier in the season, uh, we had Dr. Karen Nelson Feld from Amplified Intelligence on the show, and she kind of walked us through kind of their worldview on, on measuring attention, uh, you know, kind of beyond impressions and even just reach. Do you see that as a, the next logical step after viewability and, and fraud measurement, or is there another metric uh, before attention? Yeah, no, we think, I mean, look, I think in, when we think about attention, you know, it's a natural progression for, you know, we're measuring real human interaction, right, not bots. And then how we measure viewability, so how much people are viewing, and then you know that evolves into how the, how their attention or their engagement is with that ad. And I think when you start thinking about where this all wants to go, and where advertisers really all they care about is what is the outcome, right? The people advertisers want to measure outcomes across multiple screens, and when we think about attention, I think attention is a key proxy for outcome, like how engaged a user is, I think is just as important, if not more important, than the demographics of that user, right? Because demographics were always a proxy for trying to drive an outcome. I know men buy beer, so I'm going to try to lead to a lot of men, and so I'm going to buy Monday Night Football because that reaches a lot of men. Well, a lot of men don't buy beer, so wouldn't it be more, you know, wouldn't it be more relevant to not just measure the demos on that user, but measure how engaged they are with the ad, what the attention level is, how, how much that ad can be seen and viewed. So I think it's another important factor um, in driving outcomes and looking at you know, the combination of quality of an ad placement across multiple screens, plus the attention that it, it gets via engagement, you know, are definite drivers of an outcome which is what advertisers want. So think of quality plus attention equals outcome. And I think you know we're rolling towards that point where advertisers are looking for multiple proxies, um, particularly as things like cookies and individual identifiers go away, which get rid of proxies like age and gender and demographics and individual information that won't be able to be mapped up in the digital world like it was in the past. Well, as you, you know, kind of look out five years from now, you know, I guess this is a two-part question. So first, you know, what does the future of video ad quality and performance measurement look like? And second, uh, you know, what do you expect your customers to keep doing, start doing, and stop doing? Okay. Um, so on the, you know, looking, looking into the future, I think uh, there's a couple considerations to think about. And one I already mentioned, which was, um, the idea of having individual identifiers on consumers across multiple platforms is going to get tougher and tougher um, based on privacy rules, based on technology gardens, putting up walls between moving data from one place to the next. So the, the, the big challenge for advertisers is going to be, in, in measurement, is going to be really focus on how do I create consistency and a consistent metric across multiple different screens, right? Um, and multiple different engagements when I can't track an individual user. So I do feel like um, new metrics around contextualization, around engagement and attention, um, all of those things are going to become really important as we look to find out more about the, the what, the how, and the where, and how they impact performance and outcomes versus the who. Right? It's always been about the who, and as the who becomes harder to measure cross platforms, I think the what, the how, and the where are going to become much more important. So, um, so I think that is you know one thing to think about. Um, the second is is the true shift towards you know IP delivered television um, is not just already I think a done deal it, it's beyond a done deal it, it, it's over like they, I believe all television will be delivered whether it's linear or on demand whether it's ad supported <laughs> subscription based will be delivered you know through some type of IP connection and if it's not all a, a vast majority of it again that opens up bigger opportunities for um, measurement but it runs into the same challenges that we've seen around privacy and, 
you know, and, and walled gardens. So the, it's the mashing of this huge opportunity for advertisers um, on one hand that everything will be addressable because everything will be digital with the fact that there are roadblocks being put up every day, either technological or privacy-driven roadblocks to make that happen. So I think you know, that's the long way of saying there's a great deal of consistent measurement opportunity based on the fact that TV will be delivered in the same way that banners and mobile and everything else is going to be delivered, and even digital out of home will be delivered, right, which is via an addressable IP connection. The challenge will be how we link all of these screens together when we know that there's going to be challenges around privacy and, uh, uh, and uh, walled garden kind of blocking of, of data movement. Um, so I think that's what you know the future may look like. Uh, when we think about uh, the second part of your question, which was around, uh, it was so long ago. I didn't. I've been, talked so long, I forgot the second part of your question around what uh, folks should or should not be doing. Yeah. What do you expect? You know, looking out five years, what do you expect your customers to start doing, stop doing, and continue? Yeah. So on on the start doing, I I, I do think they're going to start to look for consistent metrics and measurement across every platform they go against, and not just video platforms, but across social, across mobile, across display. You know, consistent metrics, I think, again, are going to become a bigger and bigger deal because, as I noted before, everything's going to be IP-driven, right? So everything's going to be delivered through the same digital protocol, so there should be consistent metrics across everything. So looking for a standard across that, um, I think, is something they're going to start doing. Um, what I think they're going to stop doing, um, and I and I think this is probably more of a optimistic hope than a direct expectation, is looking at media in silos. Like I have a TV buy over here, I have a CTV buy over here, I have a mobile video buy over here. I, I do think they're going to stop looking at, um, you know, uh, their business, their advertising spend in those ways, um, because I think, um, companies that are looking for a holistic reach and engagement and performance metric across all their media will have much better outcomes than those that don't. And I think, so I think um, the first, it's not just trying to do that, but it's stopping. You, you can't think holistically across screens until you stop thinking about them as separate individual um, channels, right? It's one way. Users don't look at that one way. Users don't look at their engagement and go, oh, now I'm going to linear television. Or now I'm looking, no, they're like, oh, I'm watching this show. I have to be watching on my phone. When I go home, I may watch the same show on my connected television. And someplace else, I may engage in a whole different direction. But consumers don't look at media in the same way advertisers look at media. So they, you know, advertisers need to stop looking at media spend in the same way they have in the past. Uh, what do you think, I mean, from your perspective, you know, what's one thing that you know nobody in the industry is really talking about that you think could have a big impact? Yeah, so I think um, there's. I'll, I'll go back to since we, we you know started talking about linear TV is um, the increased the increased growth of uh, linear like formats in the digital space that are live. And from that meaning, whether it's live gaming or live platforms like Clubhouse or even just live, you know, streaming of events, um, that live aspect of IP delivered digital content continues to grow and it continues to fragment into lots of little, you know, user generated live streams of, of gaming or of, you know, discussions on Clubhouse, etc. That is a, going to be a huge a growing area of consumer engagement, which means it's going to be a huge growing area of advertiser desire, right? Anything that takes consumers away from a traditional way of engaging with media um, is going to take time away from a place where advertisers can meet people. So places like Clubhouse, places um, like Twitch, where you have live, you know, gaming or live discussions going on are places where advertisers are going to need to want to be, but are very concerning for them from a brand safety perspective. Because something that could seem as brand safe as a discussion around, you know, advertising or a gaming, you know, games that are, you know, e-games, rated E, can turn really bad really fast if discussions spin out of control. So I feel like 
there's going to need to be a seven second delay, you know, like the old TV, like, oh, the award show, you have seven second delay in case someone swore. I think where we're going to end up is we're going to need to come up with some type of seven second delay for these live streams, whether it's gaming, so the advertisers can say, whoa, this is someplace we do not want to be around, pull our ads out of the next portion of this section, um, because that you can only have so much metadata around a content area um, that will protect you if someone's totally veers off course. So I think that's something that, that advertisers aren't thinking about. They're excited to rush into these new venues of live discussion, cross screen, you know, engagement uh, of, of live streams, you know, all of the stuff they want to be there, but they're not thinking about the fact that they're live and live can get really ugly really fast. So um, I foresee a seven sec second delay button coming around somehow in the digital world as well. That last point, I will be fascinated uh, to see how that uh, combines with gambling on esports because uh, you know they're talking about the that's the next big thing and uh, the, trying to reduce the latency of the stream. So yeah. that'll be fascinating. Well, Mark, I'll get you out of here on, on one more uh, question we ask all of our guests. Sure. Uh, if you could have everyone on your team read one book right now, what would it be and why? Oh, that's that's a that's a good question. I, I'm not a big business book reader. Um, because I think that they're much more self-promotion than they are self-help. Um, so uh, I, I read a lot of science fiction. And one that I read that was pretty recent was a, was a book called The Feed. And it's pretty relevant. It's, it's, it's basically about how uh, people become so interconnected to social media that it actually starts, they lose the ability to think for themselves. And when the feed gets cut off, all society collapses. So the reason I'd have my team read that is that don't get so caught up in this when there's this going on outside and that's really what what matters so that that should be where we're thinking about how we make this better not just the screen better as well so um not a great not a great business book answer but uh but a but a life answer that i thought was really really interesting take uh, i'm very pertinent with what's going on out in the world today for sure absolutely well, Mark, I'm, I'm grateful for your time, and I know our community is going to love the conversation. So, you know, huge thanks for joining us. Absolutely, Michael. It was great talking today. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Screen Bites. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. You can find out more about Cross Screen Media at crossscreenmedia.com. And please don't forget to sign up for our weekly newsletter, Stay to the Screens. You can find us on social media at Cross Screen Media. Join us next time for more insights and analysis straight from the experts.